All right. Give me the cue. Okay, shall we pray? <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we uh, begin to wind down this evening, uh, this presentation and one left, we pray, dear Lord, that your spirit would not leave us but remain. We ask, Lord God, that you would grant us uh, more of your spirit, grant us a double portion for these remaining meetings. We pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, touch both of your servants, myself and uh, Elder Wesley. We ask, dear Lord, that you would guide in a special way uh, your people, the congregation. Lord, as we're here to, to learn, as we're here to eat the little book, we pray, dear Lord, that not only will you grant us comprehension, but that you would help us to gladly receive the message, even the bitter portion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, let's turn our Bibles to the book of James. James chapter 3. We're going to the third chapter of James. And we're going to uh, look over some of the verses that we've read before. We haven't really specifically jumped into these verses just yet. But I want to look at James chapter 3. And we'll begin in verse 13. When you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says in James chapter 3 and verse 13, it asks the question, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, when we looked at this verse before, this is what led into our studies in looking at who the wise are and what the wise understand. And we begin looking at the truths that God gives us to keep us uh, protected. Now we're going to look at the truths in a practical manner, in the sense of why God gives us these truths, not just for protection from the evil man, from the, from the strange woman or the adulterous woman, but what is the experience that God means for us to have by giving us these truths? This is what we want to uh, study in this, this, this evening. But the question is, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good what? Conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. The question is asking, who is a wise man? And the answer is, the answer that you can know who a wise man is, is he shows out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now when the Bible uses the term conversation, it uses it a little bit different than we do. As a matter of fact, uh, turn to 1 Timothy. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 to illustrate when the Bible is talking about conversation, it's not necessarily talking about uh, getting in a group and just conversing, talking with one another. When the Bible uses the term conversation, it's talking about manner of life. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy. Chapter 4 and uh, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Just to show you that when the Bible uses the word conversation, it's different than talking. Notice what it says. 1 Timothy, what chapter? Four. Chapter 4 and verse 12. The question is, who's a wise man? Who are those that have knowledge? And the Bible shows, let him or let the wise man show out of his conversation, his manner of life. Let him show by his lifestyle that he's wise. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers in what? In word. Now when the Bible is talking about in word, what is this talking about? Well, not necessarily Bible. This is talking about the manner of speaking, in word. And then it says, and in what? Conversation. You see, conversation is different than word. When the Bible uses the word conversation, it's a manner of life. You can see that in the original language as well, but I thought this Bible text might make it a little more clear. It says, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So the Bible, when it's using conversation, it's manner of life. And the wise man, those that are endued with knowledge, the wise virgins, they show that they're wise by their manner of living. Now the Bible asks the same question that's asked in James chapter 3. Who is a wise man? It asks that same question in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
So I want to go there to Ecclesiastes. We want to look at the wise man tonight. And we want to look at the manner of life that the wise man is to live. So we're looking at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And let's begin in verse 1. The question of James 3.13 is who is a wise man? The question of Ecclesiastes 8 verse 1 is who is a wise man? Notice what it says. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 1. When you're there, amen. amen. The Bible says who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to what? To shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. Now what we're going to do this evening is we want to look at things very, very simply and very practically. Who in the Bible are wise men that, wise men that you can think of as an example? Those who are able to give interpretation of a thing. Those in the Bible who actually, some even experience their face shining as the response of them being the wise men. All right, I'm hearing Moses, Daniel, Joseph. Well, let's take those three just for time. Moses, Daniel, Joseph. Can we do that? Let's start with Joseph. Was Joseph a wise man? Was Joseph able to give interpretation? All right, turn your Bible with me to the book of Exodus, or excuse me, uh, Genesis. Go to Genesis. And there's much that can be said about each of these individuals. We'll just look at a few things. I tell you what, we'll spend a little bit more time when it comes to Daniel, because that we'll just stay in the one book of Daniel and look at just a bunch of things on Daniel and his life. But let's go to Genesis 41. Let's go to Genesis 41. And let's start in verse 33. Genesis 41 and verse 33. We're going to show that Joseph is represented in the Bible as a wise man. Joseph, uh, he was able to give the interpretation of a thing. And we're going to see that Joseph, his face, shown with a holy radiance. We're told he, it's shown with the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. Notice what it says. This is Genesis 41. Let's begin with verse 33. When we're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Bible says, now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and what? Wise. Wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Now this is when Joseph is giving the interpretation of the dream of Pharaoh. We're not going to look so much at the dream as a matter as instead of we're going to look at Joseph and his life. The Bible says, just jump down to verse um, 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servant, can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the what? Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath shown thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Was Joseph a wise man? But what made him a wise man? Even a heathen understood he was a wise man. The Bible said the spirit of God was in him. Not just because he can interpret dreams, brethren. You see, Joseph, we know the story of Joseph. As a matter of fact, we're told the life experience of Joseph represents Christ's life. When you read in the spirit of prophecy, the life of Joseph and his experience represented Christ. Joseph was an individual that overcame temptation. He overcame anger, wrath, and strife. He had every reason, at least in an earthly mind, to be angry forever with his family. But he overcame every one of those things. He's an example of a wise man. And I'll bring up a statement quickly. Patriarchs and prophets... Patriarchs and Prophets, page 210. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 210. This is the third paragraph. And it's interesting because a lot of, we don't necessarily read about this in Scripture, but the spirit of prophecy shows that when Joseph was interpreting or giving the understanding of his dreams, his face would shine with a holy radiance. And the Bible says, who is a wise man? Who is as a wise man? Who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? It talks about his wisdom causes his face to shine. And his face would change with a holy boldness. Notice what it says. We're in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 2.10, paragraph 3. Speaking about when he was before his family. It says, as the lad stood before his brothers, his beautiful countenance lighted up with the spirit of inspiration. 
These could not withhold their admiration, but they did not choose to renounce their evil way, and they, halt, and they hated the purity that reproved their sins. And when you read about this in the spirit of prophecy, this capitalizing the spirit of inspiration. This wasn't just that he got happy as he was explaining. The Holy Spirit shone forth in his radiance. Joseph was a wise man. He was endued with knowledge. He was able to give interpretation. But why does the Bible describe him as a wise man? Not because he was able to understand a dream. More so it describes his life. A wise man shows forth his wisdom by his conversation. Let's look at Moses quickly. I'm not taking a lot of time to look at these individuals. Notice what your Bible says in the book of uh, Exodus. Go with me to the book of Exodus. <clears throat> now the Bible said in the book of James, let him show forth his wisdom, with, let him show forth uh, his wisdom by meekness. Now wasn't Moses the, mo the meekest man that ever lived? Yes, he was. Moses showed forth his wisdom by being meek, by being lowly, by being humble. But notice what it says about Moses. Let's look at one of the experiences of Moses' life. We're in Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 30, uh, 33. Exodus chapter 33. <clears throat> Excuse me, Exodus 34. Exodus 34. And let's start in verse 27. Exodus 34, beginning with verse 27. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the what? The Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. Then he came down from the Mount that Moses wist not that a skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. When Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, with the commandments in his hand. The Bible says, what did his face do? Shone. Why did it shine? What does the spirit of prophecy tell us that Moses saw that caused his face to shine? The glory of the commandments, she says, and the glory of Christ. And when she describes the glory of Christ, brethren, you can read about it again, patriarchs and prophets and elsewhere in the spirit shows what Moses saw. It was not merely that he saw the glory of Christ. He saw the whole plan of redemption. He was shown the faith of Jesus. Moses' face shone because he had an experience in the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now this experience you read in the spirit of prophecy, you read in great controversy. And when God's people are delivered, that chapter God's people delivered, it talks about how wicked at the end when God pours out his spirit upon the righteous and, and they hear the day and the hour of Christ coming. They hear the covenant of peace. The Bible says their face shines as did Moses and the wicked can't behold, can't look upon them. They have an experience. Moses, brethren, look at the life of Moses. And the life of Moses expresses many different truths. A lot of the times we focus on the fact that one sin kept Moses out of Canaan. And brethren, that's the truth. One sin for us will keep us out of Canaan. But what about the rest of Moses' life? When you look at Moses' life, did Moses overcome natural, hereditary, and cultivated tendencies to evil? Did he overcome a, 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 an angry spirit? Yes, he did. Anger lashed out and killed a man. God sent him into the wilderness to be amongst the sheep for 40 years. He became lowly and humble. The Bible says he was the meekest man that ever lived. It wasn't until then that he was able to lead the children of Israel. Moses thought he was to do it by his might and by his prowess. But brethren, the Bible shows that Moses, the meekest man that ever lived, that overcame temptation, that was a representative of Jesus Christ himself. He was a wise man, not so much by what he knew, but again by his life. Who was a wise man? Who's endued with knowledge among you? Let him show forth his wisdom 
through his conversation. Let's look at the last one that you mentioned. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Let's go to the book of Daniel. And before we jump into Daniel, turn to Ezekiel. Let me just read a statement in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28. I want to just pick a few verses in the Bible about Daniel. Ezekiel 28. Now I don't, and, and maybe you can help me uh, in, this, in this area, I don't recall in the Bible nor spirit of prophecy that Daniel's face ever shone with a holy radiance like Joseph and like Moses. Um, but we do understand that Daniel was indeed a wise man and a dude with knowledge. But more so about Daniel, you know, we always focus again on the prophecies and visions of Daniel, but there are the same number of chapters in his book that are devoted to his experience. And I want to look at some of these with you, but we're going to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Notice what your Bible says. Ezekiel 28. Let's begin in verse, uh, verse 1. Ezekiel 28. Verse 1. Are we all there? Amen. Amen. The Bible says, now, before we read this, I'm simply using these verses to show a uh, to show a contrast, all right? For an example, when the Bible talks about how God will make his people uh, precious, even as precious as the, as the golden wedge of Ophir. You know, the golden wedge of Ophir, this is, this is the epitome of pure gold. And God would make his people better than that. We're going to read about Daniel here. And it shows that Daniel was an extremely wise man. Notice what it says. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, Say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than who? Than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. The point I'm here, wanting you to see here is the individual described as the Prince of Tyrus, which is a symbol of the papal power. And we're not getting into that. That's not the focus of our study. Daniel is used as the epitome of wisdom. Daniel is used as the point of reference to a wise man. The Bible says you are wiser than Daniel. Your wisdom and your understanding has gotten you riches. In other words, Daniel's wisdom and understanding sets the mark, sets the stage. Daniel's a wise man. Do we see, you understand what I'm saying here? Are we all together? All right. A few other verses. Your Bible tell, takes us to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Let's go to 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. Let's look in verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 14. Here in Ezekiel 14, Daniel is again used as an example, but this time not of wisdom, but of righteousness. Notice what it says in Ezekiel 14. We're looking at verse 12. Ezekiel, what chapter are we going to? 14. We're looking at verse 12 when you're there. Amen. The Bible said, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by transgressing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but, they should deliver but their own souls by their what? Righteousness, saith the Lord. Here you have three individuals. We're focusing on the one, Daniel. He is focused on as an individual of righteousness. Both wisdom and understanding, God uses as the mark and shows that that's Daniel. And now righteousness. He's set as the mark for righteousness. Did you know that in the spirit of prophecy, anybody ever heard of the book of the sanctified life? Daniel, as well as the other Hebrew worthies, were described as perfect representations of sanctification. As a matter of fact, notice, as a matter of fact, let's go to inspiration in the, in the Bible, Daniel chapter 6. The Bible shows in Daniel chapter 6 that there was no fault found in him. He has an excellent spirit. This is the wise man. And how do we know a wise man? Is it by what he understands? Is it by what he knows? It's by his conversation because you understand, brethren, the Bible speaking about the papacy he said he was wise, but that's not the wise that we're looking at. That's not the type of, type of wisdom 
that shows the wisdom of heaven. The wisdom of heaven is described through the life. And this is what we're looking at this, this evening. We're in the book of Daniel. We're in chapter 6. Daniel, the sixth chapter. And let's begin in verse 1. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 1. We saw in Ezekiel that Daniel is held up as an individual of righteousness. Notice Daniel chapter 6. What verse? Verse 1. Bible says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because, and what? Excellent spirit was in him. He thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against this Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error nor what? Fault found in him. This is the wise man. This is the example. And of course, brethren, we understand Christ is the pattern man. Christ is the pattern man for everything, specifically character. But brethren, the Bible asks the question, who's a wise man? Let him show forth out of his manner of life, his wisdom. The Bible shows that it would cause his face to shine. Joseph was a wise man. He was able to interpret. His face shone with a holy radi radiance. But Joseph was an overcomer. Joseph would rather die than sin. When he was, he was confronted with the greatest temptation of his life that we see recorded. He said, I could not do this great wickedness and sin against the Lord. This was the type of individual that's wise. Where do we stand in comparison? When we look at Moses. Moses and his experience. Moses not only understood the law of God as explained by Christ, but Moses was given the beautiful vision of the plan of redemption. Moses understood what was taking place there. He saw the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and his face shone with a holy radiance. Moses was a wise man. Daniel, he's a wise man. The Bible lifts him up as the, as the mark of wisdom and righteousness. The Bible says an excellent spirit was in him, just like Joseph. And the Bible says that there was no fault found in him. Not in life, not in his spirituality, nor in his living as a citizen on earth. When we read this in Daniel chapter 6, it's not just about his spiritual life. It's about his citizen, being a citizen of the kingdom. They tried to find fault in his life in the kingdom. But he was a perfect man. What about us, brethren? This is a sermon for you and me. What about us? We might focus more so on the... How, how, does the, how does the world view us? Who's a wise man? Let him show forth out of his conversation. Daniel chapter 10. If we turn to Daniel chapter 10, we begin in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter... Looking at verse 1 with me. And when you're there, amen. Daniel chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. And I, I want to do this. I feel led to do this presentation in this particular way. It's been a long day. A lot of, lot of things have happened. But brethren, God wants to speak to us individually. God doesn't want us just to have a head full of knowledge and we have no experience. God is giving us individuals that we can see and how they lived and that's why all this is recorded in the Bible. So notice what it says in Daniel chapter 10 beginning with the first verse. We're talking still about Daniel. The Bible says in the third year of Cyrus king of Persia a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belshazzar and the thing was true but the time appointed was long and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days I Daniel was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also like, was like unto Beryl, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. 
but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. Here God in the Bible, uh, in the Bible Daniel is called a man who was greatly beloved, greatly beloved of heaven. There's only certain individuals in the Bible, such as Job is one that's used by God as an example. Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? All of heaven knew that Daniel was a man greatly beloved. The Bible shows that Abraham was a friend of God. How does heaven view us? Are we greatly beloved? Are we a friend of God? Are we used as examples to the devil to say, have you considered my servant so and so? The Bible shows that because Daniel had such a loving, beautiful experience in his wisdom, he had a full vision of Christ. And in, Reve in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1, the last vision of Daniel, the last vision of Daniel is identified and characterized by Christ. And in our last presentation, we saw that those at the end of the world, we're to see the same glory that was revealed to Daniel. And when we're looking in Daniel chapter 11, 40 through 45, or Daniel chapter 11, 1 through 45, do we see the same vision that Daniel saw? Do we see Christ in his high priestly work? Do we see that in the vision? Or all, do we, do all, all we see, do we just see beasts and timelines and things of that nature? That's not the power and the glory that we need to see to give the trumpet a certain sound. That's just a part of it. Brethren, the full vision, the vision of Daniel is identified by Christ. And Daniel, the wise man, saw these things because he was privileged to see them because of his lifestyle. Now, since we're talking about the lifestyle of Daniel, turn to Daniel chapter 1. Let's make it even more practical. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And let's look in verse 8 together. Daniel chapter 1, what verse are we going to? Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. You see, brethren, because I'm seeking for the power of the third angel's message. And I believe all of us want the power of the third angel's message. And we're told that when the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. Well, what is the, what is the purpose of influence? What does influence do? It reaches you. It causes you to move. Brethren, if these truths are causing us to become a different type of person, then you've missed something. There's some keys, there's some principles, there's some aspects of the message that you've missed. We can't blame the message and say, well, these brethren always say, with a better understanding of Daniel and Revelation, I'll have an entirely different religious experience. Well, I know more, but look at my life. It's because we are missing a piece of the puzzle. And this is only something that an individual can receive. You see, when Daniel saw the vision, he alone saw the vision. And when we come into these, in, these meetings, in these environments, God can pour out his spirit collectively. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen that way. It's in these type of meetings that God does that. But it's an individual experience. Remember, hearts around you can be being touched and you miss it. It's individual. We have to see the vision. But let's look a little bit more at the lifestyle of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Verse 8. When you're there, amen. amen. The Bible says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not what? Be himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now it's very clear to see that Daniel is also an example of true temperance. True sanctification and true temperance. This characterized Daniel's life. Some of us, we might focus on one of the aspects and be missing it at the plate. Our plate right before us might be the problem. This might be the key that we're missing to receive the experience. But that's a little bit deeper because the Bible says that he would not defile himself with a portion of whose meat? King. Who's the king? king? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of what? king of Babylon, the king of the north. And what is meat a symbol of in the Bible? Doctrine. Daniel purposed in his heart, he would not defile himself with the, with the portion of the king's meat. 
He didn't want to receive the doctrine of Babylon. He wouldn't drink the wine which he drank. What is wine? Doctrine. Not just false doctrine, but doctrine, period. God gives his people wine. There's nothing wrong with pure wine. But the Bible says Daniel would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. He wouldn't uh, defile himself by a false lifestyle, a false diet, both physically or spiritually. And some of us, brethren, we still read books by infidel authors. Some of us, do, do, do you, you understand what I mean by an infidel author? An infidel is someone who's not of this faith. What do we have to learn from anybody who doesn't keep the Sabbath? I mean, really think about that, brethren. I don't care how popular uh, uh, purpose-driven life and all these books are, brethren. Daniel purposed he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. And all false doctrine is the king's meat and the wine which he drank. So, brethren, we need to come to the point where we have the pure truth as well, not just the pure diet. Because we might win on the diet aspect and fail on the truth. Or we might have the truth aspect and fail on the diet. Either way, either way you're becoming defiled. But Daniel is an example of an individual who would not defile himself. And as a result, what happens? Let's jump down in our Bible to verse uh, 17. As a result of him refusing uh, the false diet of Babylon, both physically and spiritually, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, beginning with verse 17, amen when you're there, the Bible says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and what? Wisdom. And Daniel had what? Understanding in all visions and dreams. Isn't that what we want to do? Don't we want to understand visions and dreams? The visions of Daniel and John? Well, brethren, we need the experience of Daniel. We need to have the experience of the four Hebrew worthies. The Bible says, now at the end of the days, verse 18, now at the end of the days, king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them was all found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of king what? Cyrus. Now we read past that verse as if it has no significance. We read past that verse, we just blow right past it. What does it mean that Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus? Well, brethren, who is Cyrus? Who is Cyrus? Or he was the king of Media and Persia, but wasn't he called the anointed shepherd? Wasn't he the one that destroyed Babylon? Wasn't he a king of the east? When the Bible is saying that Daniel continued even unto Cyrus, we have to understand what took place with Cyrus. How was Babylon brought down? How was Babylon brought down? The waters were dried up. The waters were dried up to prepare the way for the king of the east. Brethren, this is the sixth plague. This is the sixth plague. Who are the individuals that make it through the plagues? It's the 144,000. Who does Daniel represent? 144,000. But you see, Daniel, not only did he get victory over physical diet, he got victory over his spiritual diet. The Bible says he was a righteous man. The Bible says he has an excellent spirit. There was no fault found in him. The Bible said that even when it came to his life as a citizen, there was no fault. The Bible shows all these different things. He is a depiction of those that will make it through to see the king of the east come and overtake Babylon. Brother, he's a symbol of 144,000. All of us in here are to strive with the power of God, that God has given us to be a part of that number. That means we need to have all experience. All of this experience should be ours. Now your Bible your Bible takes us to the book of Ephesians. Turn your Bible with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And there are so many more uh, things that we can look at as far as individuals and their life and their struggles and their overcoming. Because all, all the individuals that we looked at, brethren, they are a symbol of the overcomers in the end of time. These are the wise that will have understanding. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, 
We've looked at some of the uh, reasons why God gives these truths to us as far as protection in the end of the world. But brethren, let's look at some of the spiritual reasons God gives us all this light and knowledge. Ephesians chapter 1. We're looking in verse 17. Ephesians, what chapter are we going to? Chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of what? Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Here we have Paul praying for the church of Ephesus. And not just the church of Ephesus, but the church at the end of the world. And the Bible says that God, the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Father of glory, may give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Why? Did Paul want the church to have wisdom, understanding, and the revelation? Why? Notice what it says in the next verse. The eyes of your understanding being what? Enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. And the, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Why did he pray that received wisdom and revelation? That they would know the hope of God's calling. That they would know. And this word know, brethren, again, is not just referring to here. It's referring to that they would experience. The Bible says their eyes needed to be enlightened. Brethren, how are our eyes enlightened? How are our eyes enlightened? Studying the word of God, the knowledge of God. It, reading in context, you're correct that God would give us wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God that our eyes would be enlightened. But where do we find the wisdom and revelation of God? In the word of God, but I want to submit to you, it's found in the little book. And the little book, what does the little book taste like? Sweet as honey. You, where in the Bible can we show that when someone eats honey, their eyes are enlightened. Turn your Bible with me. Keep your finger in Ephesians quickly. Keep your finger in Ephesians. Notice what your Bible says in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Yes, 1 Samuel. And we're in chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14. Let's begin in verse 27. 1 Samuel chapter 14 27 and when you're there amen Ephesians we have Paul praying that the church would receive wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God that their eyes would be enlightened but notice what it says in 1st Samuel 14 verse 27 but Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath wherefore he put forth the end of his rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to, the, to his mouth and his eyes were what Enlightened. You see, this is when, Paul, when Saul told nobody to eat the whole day until his enemies were destroyed. Jonathan didn't hear that. So when Jonathan came, he comes into the wood. You can read about it, that there was honey dripping all over. And nobody was eating. Because the, the, the leader of the people told him not to eat the honey. Oh, there's a whole lot of significance in that. There's a whole lot of significance in that. Honey all over the place, but don't eat it. Jonathan... Jonathan didn't do that. Jonathan saw it all over the place. He stuck his rod into a honeycomb, put it in his hand, and put it to his mouth. And the Bible says his eyes were enlightened. The Bible says, Then answered one of the people in verse 28 and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How are our eyes enlightened, brethren? It's by eating the honeycomb. It's by eating the honey. But you see, Saul, over there in, in uh, Bering Springs, he tells the people not to eat the honeycomb. He charges them with an oath and cursed be the man that eats them. And so the people are faint. People over there are faint. People in the church are faint because they're not eating the honeycomb. But there's a few little ragtag groups like Jonathan that don't listen to Saul. 
and they go ahead and they eat the honeycomb and their eyes are enlightened. And when the people say, what are you doing studying these things? They say, listen, father has troubled Israel. Father's telling people to Israel, telling things to Israel that's troubling them. It's making the people faint. It's making them weary. See how my eyes are enlightened because I tasted a little of this honeycomb. The Bible using this phrase in Ephesians chapter 1. Going back to Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible says in Ephesians the first chapter. In verse 18. How the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened. And for what Paul says that we may know what is the hope of his calling? And what is the inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? I want to look at just these three things before we close. The Bible says that when we have our eyes enlightened by the honeycomb, we will know what the hope of his calling is. And to know it is not just here. It's experiencing it. Brethren, what is the hope of God's calling? What are the truths contained in the hope of God's calling? Brethren, it's beautiful. This is what God wants us to understand. This is why holy radiance shines from the two, the two tables. Brethren, what is the hope of God's calling? Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Romans. What is the hope of God's calling? Romans chapter 8. begin in verse 28. We know this verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We're talking about the hope of God's call. What is the hope of God's calling? Romans chapter 8. We're looking in verse 28. Bible says, things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknow, he predestinate to be conformed to the image of, the, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, or the first fruits among many brethren. For over whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also what? Justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified those who are the call the hope of God's calling they are conformed to the image of his son they are justified and they are glorified now you might say well wait a minute you skipped over a process what happened to sanctification well brethren when you're sanctified you're conformed to the image of his son so the hope of his calling brethren is justification sanctification and glorification and those who have their eyes enlightened are not just to know how to break down justification and how to explain sanctification and how to describe glorification they are to experience it the Bible goes on to say in the book of Philippians turn your Bible with me to the book of Philippians knowing these truths brethren is not just a Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to know more. It's a high calling. It's a high calling. And when we understand these things, this is the number one reason why it baffles me every day that God would bring me from the gutter to give me these truths. Why would he want to justify and sanctify and glorify me? Why would he want my eyes to be enlightened who cursed him openly and who did all manner of evil against him? Why would God want to call me to these truths? Brethren, it shows nothing but the mercy and love of Jesus Christ. This is the experience of the wise. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians, we're looking in chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, let's go to verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, looking at verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, what verse are we going to? Verse 7, notice Philippians. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. It says, and we're talking about the whole God's call. The Bible says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung 
that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When the Bible says here that he wants to be found not having his own righteousness by the law, but the righteousness that is of the faith of Christ, or the righteousness that comes through the faith of Jesus. And what is the faith of Jesus? Brethren, it's the testimony of the prophets. The testimony of the prophets, brethren, is not just to let you know what's coming. It's to bring the experience. But it continues on to say, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made possible unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of what? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Your eyes are enlightened so you know the hope of this high calling. And the way that Paul puts it in Philippians, the Bible says, that you receive the righteousness of God, which is by faith, that you might know him, that you might know, the Bible says that you might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings and be made conformable unto his death, that you may attain to the resurrection of Christ or the resurrection of life. These are the things, brethren, that all of us are to experience and to press forward to attain. This is the hope of God's calling. Let's look at one more in the book of 1 John. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 in verse 1. 1 John chapter 3 in verse 1. And brethren, I want you to understand something uh, that it, it happened to me personally. And I just want to explain something very personal to you. And maybe you've experienced the same thing. For years. For years, I would hear people talk about righteousness by faith. I mean, they would explain it. They would have powerful sermons. They would have graphs. They would have charts. They would have books. They would have CD. They would have everything you would need to understand righteousness by faith. But knowing many of them that proclaim these things personally, I never saw it. And me trying to experience it, never had it. And instead, I went backwards in my experience and became more like the devil than like Christ. But brethren, when you taste a little of the honey and God enlightens your eyes, I'm gonna say like Paul, not though as I have obtained to the experience, but I press towards the mark. I know where it is now and I know where it comes. And there are so many people in Adventism that are always talking about righteousness by faith, but don't have a clue where the power of righteousness by faith is. Brethren, it's in the honeycomb. It's in, the, it's in the little book. That's why the spirit of prophecy can say beyond the shadow of a doubt, if you have a better understanding of these things, you will have an entirely different religious experience. There will be seen among us a great revival. And brethren, this is something that God wants every one of us to experience. We're not here just so that you can go back and say, look what I've learned. The power behind the message is that your life has changed. Who's a wise man? Let him show forth in his conversation that he's wise. The Bible says in 1 John 3, let's begin in verse 1 together. 1 John chapter 3, what verse are we looking at? We're looking at verse 1. The Bible says, behold, are we all there together? Behold what manner of love the Father he should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this what? Hope in him, in him purifieth himself even as what? 
is pure. What is the hope of God's calling? Well, we saw that God's calling is justification, sanctification, glorification, knowing him, the power of his resurrection, the power of his sufferings, being a partaker of Christ. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifies himself, even as God is pure. Brethren, how pure is God? If you can put a percentage on it, how pure is God? 100, 100 plus. Let's be safe and just say that. 100 plus. He is the epitome of perfection. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. Now we look at this verse and we say, how can we purify ourself like God is pure? Well, brethren, we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There are things that God has given us to do that he will not do for us. And we need to understand that we're waiting for us. Sometimes we pray the wrong type of prayer. Lord, take this from me. God wants you to sacrifice it, to give it up. If he takes it, it's not a sacrifice. And when it comes to the Day of Atonement, one of the duties on the Day of Atonement for the congregation is to make a sacrifice by fire to the Lord. And a sacrifice by fire to the Lord does not increase, brethren, it consumes. A sacrifice is not a sacrifice if I take it from you. And that's a bitter truth of the little book that I'm having to learn. There are things that I've prayed to God for years to take from me. And he's trying to show me, you know what? You need to give it up. Put it on the altar. This is to be a partaker in my sufferings. Brethren, this is part of the experience. Whosoever hath the hope of God's calling will purify himself even as God is pure. Put it on the altar. Give things up, brethren. Don't expect God to take from you that which he expects you to do for yourself. The Bible tells us back in the book of Ephesians, in the few moments that we have together, notice what it says back in Ephesians chapter 1. Not only are we to experience the hope of his calling by having our eyes enlightened, but we are to know in verse 18, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, we are to know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, what is the rich inheritance of the saints? We don't have to go too far. We don't have to go all over and for a time we can't. Let's just look in chapter one of Ephesians. Let's just look at Ephesians chapter one and let's start in verse, we'll start in verse three. We're gonna talk about the inheritance of the saints and that which we are to know by experience. Bible says in verse three, when you're all there, amen. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded unto uh, to us word, where he in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained and what an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom he also after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and whom after also ye in whom also after that ye believe ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our what? Inheritance unto of the purchased possession unto the of his glory. Brethren, what is the rich inheritance of the saints? Redemption, amen. But there is a specific seal that is the earnest or the down payment of this inheritance. And the Bible says, when you look in verse 12 and onward, he should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom he also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom he 
spirit of promise, which is the earnest or pledge of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. It's not just the golden streets. It's not just looking forward to that which is to come. It's experiencing that which God is even bringing now upon his saints, the seal of the Holy Spirit. Our eyes are to be enlightened so that we can know by experience the riches of the inheritance of the saints. Let's look at the last one, brethren. The Bible talked about the says, since we're in Ephesians, just to read it again in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Let's stay in the Let's turn to chapter 3. What is the greatness of God's power in those who believe? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 20 together. Ephesians, what chapter are we going to? Chapter 3 and we're looking in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. When you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, and this is a very well verse of scripture. The Bible says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the what? Power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now what is the power that worketh in us? That by this power he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Just look up a few verses. Look up a few verses. Start in verse 16. What is this power? It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his what? His spirit in the inner man. This is the first thing we're to experience. To be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts how? By faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints the what? the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of what? That's not what it says. That's not what it says. I've always thought that myself, that we are to know the length and the depth and the height and the breadth of the love of Christ, but it didn't say that. It says that we would know the length and the depth and the breadth and the height and to know the love of Christ. Well, brethren, when we talk about length, and depth and breadth and height that's measurement isn't it what is it that God's people or all saints brethren that's the wording the Bible says that we are to know or to be able to comprehend with all saints what are all saints in the end of time going to comprehend brethren Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 and verse 2 identifies that John was giving a measuring read and he was told to go and measure the temple, the altar, and them that worship therein. Was he not? And when you measure, you measure the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. Elder, Elder uh, 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 Pippinger took us to Zechariah chapter 2. And let's just, for, for, for clarity, go back to Zechariah chapter 2. Notice Zechariah. Zechariah, where are we going? Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2. And when you're there, amen. Zechariah chapter 2. The Bible says, And I lifted up mine eyes again, verse 1, and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whether goest thou? measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. Brethren, all the saints understand what this means. When the temple is being measured in Zechariah and in Revelation, all saints comprehend it. All those who are represented as saints are to comprehend this. This is also brought out in the book of Ezekiel. Flip over to Ezekiel. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. But let's give another third witness. Ezekiel, let's look in chapter 40, brethren. Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel chapter 40, beginning with verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 40, beginning with what verse? 
verse 1, and you can read chapter 40 and 41 and 42, and it's all about a man measuring the temple. The Bible says in Ezekiel 40, beginning with verse 1, in the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me. In the vision of God brought he me into a land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which there was a frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither and behold there was a man whose appearance was like unto the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears and set thine heart upon all that I will show thee. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel and behold a wall on the outside of the house round about in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit of a hand's breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building one reed and the height one reed. And you continue to read, read in the Bible and he's measuring every aspect of the temple. Brethren, this is not a literal temple that is being measured. This is the spiritual temple of God's people. And what is the length of God's people? and the breadth, and the height, and the depth, all saints are to comprehend it. Now, I'm not going into a sermon on that. But brethren, we need to understand these things. The Bible doesn't mince words or, or waste space. It doesn't deal with chapter upon chapter of a man measuring the temple if he doesn't want us to understand it. And Paul says very clear, that the power that works in us, this mighty power, not only gives us the understanding of God's love, but we're able to comprehend, we're able to understand with all saints the spiritual temple's measurements. Measure the temple, the altar, and them that worship therein. And I want to end back in Ephesians chapter 3, in closing now. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's finish off what we did not read in Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning again at verse 16, Bible says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the what? Fullness of God. If someone ever comes to you, brethren, and says, why do you need to understand these things? What is the importance of the 2520? Why does it really matter what the daily is? After all, they both seem to fit. Why does it matter who the sixth head is? And why do all these things matter? Now, we can come with some intellectual understanding and begin to break things down. But brethren, the reason why God wants our eyes to be enlightened is so that we can be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the reason it matters. That's why we have to understand. And the wise at the end of the world have the experience. The way that Daniel puts it, they're purified, made white, and tried. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, Lord, as beautiful as your high calling for us is, it's also a very bitter pill. It's also bitter for us in our belly because we realize, Lord, that we're not measuring up. We realize, dear Lord, that we haven't experienced to your fullness the hope of your calling. We're not able, dear Father, to fully comprehend with all saints the length and the breadth, the depth and the height. Lord, we desire, we press towards the mark to understand our high calling and to know the love of Christ that passeth all understanding. Lord, we desire to be filled with the fullness of God. This is the reason why we're here. And if we're here for any other reason, Father, I believe that you have spoken to our hearts. And you've told us the, re the real reason why you desired for us to come into this meeting. 
Lord, so many different truths are being laid out before us. Let us not be puffed up and become wise in our own conceit, thinking that we're better than the others, when the reality is you have shown us these things that we may be fit representatives of Christ, individuals who you can put the name of your Father in the forehead. Lord, we want to be those ones. We want to be represented as Jesus, represented as the wise man, that shows forth our wisdom by our conversation. Let us have that experience, Lord, and help us, show us what in our life we need to lay on the altar. Show us in our life the things that we need to give up. For you've told us that everyone that hath this hope in himself purifies himself, even as you are pure. Help us, dear God. Grant us the power, work within us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.